A Cargo of Cat from the Collected Works of Ambrose Bierce. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. A Cargo of Cat by Ambrose Bierce. On the 16th day of June, 1874, the ship Mary Jane sailed from Malta, heavy laden with cat. This cargo gave us a good deal of trouble. It was not in bales, but had been dumped into the hold loose. Captain Doble, who had once commanded a ship that carried coals, said he had found that plan the best. When the hold was full of cat, the hatch was battened down, and we felt good. Unfortunately, the mate, thinking the cats would be thirsty, introduced a hose into one of the hatches and pumped in a considerable quantity of water, and the cats in the lower levels were all drowned. You have seen a dead cat in a pond. You remember its circumference at the waist. Water multiplies the magnitude of the dead cat by ten. On the first day out, it was observed that the ship was much strained. She was three feet wider than usual, and as much as ten feet shorter. The convexity of her deck was visually augmented fore and aft, but she turned up at both ends. Her rudder was clean out of the water, and she would answer to the helm only when running directly against a strong breeze. The rudder, when perverted to one side, would rub against the wind, and slew her around, and then she wouldn't steer any more. Owing to the curvature of the keel, the masts came together at the top, and a sailor who had gone up the foremast got bewildered, came down the mizzenmast, looked out over the stern at the receding shores of Malta, and shouted, Land ho! The ship's fastenings were all giving way. The water on each side was lashing into foam by the tempest of flying bolts that she shed at every pulsation of the cargo. She was quietly wrecking herself, without assistance, from wind or wave, by the sheer internal energy of feline expansion. I went to the skipper about it. He was in his favorite position, sitting on the deck supporting his back against the binnacle, making a V of his legs and smoking. Captain Doble, I said, respectfully touching my hat, which was really not worthy of respect. This floating palace is afflicted with curvature of the spine, and likewise greatly swollen. Without raising his eyes, he courteously acknowledged my presence by knocking the ashes from his pipe. Permit me, Captain, I said, with simple dignity, to repeat that this ship is much swollen. If that is true, said the gallant mariner, reaching for his tobacco pouch, I think it would be as well to swab her down with liniment. There is a bottle of it in my cabin. Better suggest it to the mate. But, Captain, there's no time for empirical treatment. Some of the planks at the water line have started. The skipper rose and looked out over the stern toward the land. He fixed his eyes on the foaming wake. He gazed into the water to starboard and to port. Then he said, My friend, the whole darn thing is started. Sadly and silently I turned from the obdurate man and walked forward. Suddenly there was a burst of thunder sound. The hatch that had held down the cargo was flung whirling into space and sailed in the air like a blown leaf. Pushing upward through the hatch was a smooth, square column of cat. Grandly and impressively it grew. Slowly, serenely, majestically it rose toward the welkin, the relaxing keel parting at the headmast to give it a fair chance. I have stood at Naples and seen Vesuvius painting the town red. From Catania have marked afar upon the flanks of Etna, the lava's awful pursuit of the astonished rooster 
and the despairing pig. The fiery flow from Kilauea's crater thrusting itself into the forest and licking the entire country clean is as familiar to me as my mother tongue. I have seen glaciers a thousand years old and quite bald, heading for a valley full of tourists at the rate of an inch a month. I have seen a saturated solution of mining camps go down a mountain river to make a sociable call on the valley farmers. I have stood behind a tree on a battlefield and seen a compact square mile of armed men moving with irresistible momentum to the rear. Whenever anything grand in magnitude or motion is billed to appear, I commonly manage to beat my way into the show, and in reporting it, I am a man of unscrupulous veracity. But I have seldom observed anything like the solid gray column of Maltese cat. It is unnecessary to explain, I suppose, that each individual Grimalkin in the outfit, with that readiness of resource which distinguishes the species, had grappled with tooth and nail as many others as it could hook onto. This preserved the formation. It made the column so stiff that when the ship rolled, and the Mary Jane was a devil to roll, it swayed from side to side like a mast, and the mate said if it grew much taller, he would have to order it cut away, or it would capsize us. Some of the sailors went to work at the pumps, but these discharged nothing but fur. Captain Doble raised his eyes from his toes and shouted, Let go the anchor! but being assured that nobody was touching it, apologized and resumed his reverie. The chaplain said if there were no objections, he would like to offer up a prayer, and a gambler from Chicago produced a pack of cards, proposing to throw round for the first jack. The parson's plan was adopted, and as he uttered the final amen, the cats struck up a hymn. All the living ones were now above deck, and every mother's son of them sang. Each had a pretty fair voice, but no ears. Nearly all their notes in the upper register were more or less cracked and disobedient. The remarkable thing about the voices was their range. In that crowd were cats of seventeen octaves, and the average could not have been less than twelve. Number of cats per invoice, 127,000. Estimated number of dead swellers, 6,000. Total songsters, 121,000. Average number of octaves per cat, 12. Total octaves, 1,452,000. It was a great concert. It lasted three days and nights, or, counting each night as seven days, 24 days altogether. And we could not go below for provisions. At the end of that time, the cook came forward, shaking up some beans in a hat, and holding a large knife. Sheepmates, he said, we have done all that mortals can do. Let us now draw lots. We were blindfolded in turn, and drew. But just as the cook was forcing the fatal black bean upon the fattest man, the concert closed with a suddenness that waked the man on the lookout. A moment later, every Grimalkin relaxed his hold on his neighbors, the column lost its cohesion, and, with 121,000 dull, sickening thuds that beat as one, the whole business fell to the deck. Then, with a wild farewell wail, that feline host sprang spitting into the sea and struck out southward for the African shore. The southern expansion of Italy, as every schoolboy knows, resembles in shape an enormous boot. We had drifted within sight of it. The cats in the fabric had spied it, and their alert imaginations were instantly affected with the lively sense of the size, weight, and probable momentum of its flung bootjack. The End of A Cargo of Cat by Ambrose Beard The Childhood of Abraham by Johann Gottfried Herder, 1744-1803 to 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In a cave was Abraham brought up, for the tyrant Nimrod sought after his life. But even in the dark cave, the light of God was in him. He reflected and said to himself, Who is my creator? after sixteen years he went forth and when for the first time he beheld the heavens and the earth how was he astonished and how did he rejoice he asked of all created things around him who is your creator up rose the sun and he fell prostrate at its sight that said he is the creator for its form is beautiful the sun arose and went down and at evening disappeared then arose the moon and abraham spake thus to himself that light which departed was not the god of the heavens perhaps it is this smaller light which yonder multitude of stars obey but the moon and the stars also went down and abraham stood alone he sought his father and demanded of him who is the god of the heavens and the earth and Terah pointed to his idols. I will prove them, said he to himself, and when he was alone, he laid the most delicious food before them. If ye are living gods, he said, then receive your offering. But there the god stood, and moved not. And can my father take these for gods, said the boy? Well, perhaps I may instruct him. He took his staff and dashed all the gods save one upon the earth. Then laying the shaft in its hand, he cried to his father, Father, thy first god has slain all his brothers. Angrily, Terah beheld him and replied, Thou art mocking me, boy. How can he, whom my own hands have formed, have done this? Oh, be not angry, my father, said Abraham, and let thine ear receive what thy mouth utters. If thou trustest not in the power of thy God to perform what even my boyish hand has done, how can he be the God who created thee and me, and the heavens and the earth? And Terah was silenced by the words of the child. But the story of his deed soon reached the ear of the tyrant Nimrod and summoning him to his presence he thus addressed him my god shalt thou worship boy or the fiery furnace shall be thy reward for at the birth of abraham all the soothsayers had foretold to the king that he would destroy the idols and make void the laws of the king throughout the empire therefore the king persecuted him who is thy god o king said the undaunted boy the fire is my god answered he that mightiest of beings fire said the boy is extinguished by water water is easily borne up by the clouds the clouds are driven by the winds and the winds are resisted by man thus man is the mightiest of beings and i am the mightiest of men exclaimed the king worship me or the fiery furnace shall be thy reward then the boy cast up his calm and serious eye and said yesterday i saw the sun rise in the morning and go down in the evening command o king that to-day it may arise in the evening and go down in the morning then i will worship thee and abraham was cast into the glowing fire but the power of the fire harmed not the boy an angel took him softly in his arms and fanned the flame from him like the exhalation of a lily more beautiful than before the boy came forth from the fire and soon god appeared to him and called to him out of chaldea and consecrated him to be his friend and abraham was the founder for the whole world of the true divine worship of the one god of heaven and earth 
End of The Childhood of Abraham by Johann Gottfried Herder, seventeen forty four to eighteen hundred and three. The China Go by Jack London. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The China Go. The coral waxes, the palm grows, but man departs. Tahitian proverb. Ah Cho did not understand French. He sat in the crowded courtroom, very weary and bored, listening to the unceasing, explosive French that now one official and now another uttered. It was just so much gabble to Ah Cho, and he marveled at the stupidity of the Frenchman who took so long to find out the murderer of Chung Ga, and who did not find him at all. The five hundred coolies on the plantation knew that Ah San had done the killing, and here was Ah San not even arrested. It was true that all the coolies had agreed secretly not to testify against one another, but then it was so simple the Frenchman should have been able to discover that Ah San was the man. They were very stupid, these Frenchmen. Ah Cho had done nothing of which to be afraid. He had had no hand in the killing. It was true that he had been present at it, and Shemmer, the overseer on the plantation, had rushed into the barracks immediately afterward and caught him there, along with four or five others. But what of that? Chung Ga had been stabbed only twice. It stood to reason that five or six men could not inflict two stab wounds. At the most, if a man had struck but once, only two men could have done it. So it was that Ah Cho reasoned when he, along with his four companions, had lied and blocked and obfuscated in their statements to the court concerning what had taken place. They had heard the sounds of the killing, and like Shemmer they had run to the spot. They had got there before Shemmer, that was all. True, Shemmer had testified that, attracted by the sound of quarreling as he chanced to pass by, he had stood for at least five minutes outside that then when he entered he found the prisoners already inside and that they had not entered just before because he had been standing by the one door to the barracks but what of that ah cho and his four fellow prisoners had testified that shemmer was mistaken in the end they would be let go they were all confident of that five men could not have their heads cut off for two stab wounds besides no foreign devil had seen the killing but these frenchmen were so stupid in china as ah cho well knew the magistrate would order all of them to the torture and learn the truth. The truth was very easy to learn under torture, but these Frenchmen did not torture, bigger fools they. Therefore, they would never find out who killed Chung Ga. But Ah Cho did not understand everything. The English company that owned the plantation had imported into Tahiti, at great expense, the 500 coolies. The stockholders were clamoring for dividends, and the company had not yet paid any. Wherefore, the company did not want its costly contract laborers to start the practice of killing one another. Also, there were the French, eager and willing to impose upon the China Goes the virtues and excellences of French law. There was nothing like setting an example once in a while. And besides, of what use was New Caledonia, except to send men to live out their days in misery and pain in payment of the penalty for being frail and human? Ah Cho did not understand all this. He sat in the courtroom and waited for the baffled judgment that would set him and his comrades free to go back to the plantation and work out the terms of their contracts. This judgment would soon be rendered. Proceedings were drawing to a close. He could see that. There was no more testifying, no more gabble of tongues. The French devils were tired, too, and evidently waiting for the judgment. And as he waited, he remembered back in his life to the time when he had signed the contract and set sail in the ship for Tahiti. Times had been hard in his seacoast village, and when he indentured himself to labor for five years in the South Seas, at fifty cents Mexican a day, he had thought himself fortunate. There were men in his village who toiled a whole year for ten dollars Mexican, and there were women who made nets all year round for five dollars while in the houses of shopkeepers there were maid servants who received four dollars for a year of service and here he was to receive fifty cents a day for one day only one day he was to receive that princely sum what if the work were hard at the end of the five years he would return home that was in the contract and he would never have to work again he would be a rich man for life with a house of his own a wife and children growing up to venerate him yes and in back of the house he would have a small garden 
a place of meditation and repose with goldfish in a tiny lakelet and wind bells tinkling in the several trees and there would be a high wall all around so that his meditation and repose should be undisturbed well he had worked out three of those five years he was already a wealthy man in his own country through his earnings and only two years more intervened between the cotton plantation on tahiti and the meditation and repose that awaited him but just now he was losing money because of the unfortunate accident of being present at the killing of chunga he had lain three weeks in prison and for each day of those three weeks he had lost fifty cents but now judgment would soon be given and he could go back to work acho was twenty-two years old he was happy and good-natured and it was easy for him to smile while his body was slim in the asiatic way his face was rotund it was round like the moon and it irradiated a gentle complacence and a sweet kindliness of spirit that was unusual among his countrymen nor did his looks belie him he never caused trouble never took part in wrangling he did not gamble his soul was not harsh enough for the soul that must belong to a gambler he was content with little things and simple pleasures the hush and quiet in the cool of the day after the blazing toil in the cotton field was to him an infinite satisfaction he could sit for hours gazing at a solitary flower and philosophizing about the mysteries and riddles of being a blue heron on a tiny crescent of sandy beach a silvery splatter of flying fish or a sunset of pearl and rose across the lagoon could entrance him to all forgetfulness of the procession of wearisome days and of the heavy lash of shemmer shemmer carl shemmer was a brute a brutish brute but he earned his salary he got the last particle of strength out of the five hundred slaves for slaves they were until their term of years was up shemmer worked hard to extract the strength from those five hundred sweating bodies and to transmute it into bales of fluffy cotton ready for export his dominant iron-clad primeval brutishness was what enabled him to effect the transmutation also he was assisted by a thick leather belt three inches wide and a yard in length with which he always rode and which on occasion could come down on the naked back of a stooping coolie with the report like a pistol shot these reports were frequent when shemmer rode down the furrowed field once at the beginning of the first year of contract labor he had killed a coolie with a single blow of his fist he had not exactly crushed the man's head like an eggshell but the blow had been sufficient to addle what was inside and after being sick for a week the man had died but the chinese had not complained to the french devils that ruled over tahiti it was their own lookout shemmer was their problem they must avoid his wrath as they avoided the venom of the centipedes that lurked in the grass or crept into the sleeping quarters on rainy nights the chinagos such they were called by the indolent brown-skinned island folk saw to it that they did not displease shemmer too greatly this was equivalent to rendering up to him a full measure of efficient toil that blow of shemmer's fist had been worth thousands of dollars to the company and no trouble ever came of it to shemmer the french with no instinct for colonization futile in their childish play game of developing the resources of the island were only too glad to see the english company succeed what matter of shemmer and his redoubtable fist the chinago that died while well, he was only a chinago besides he died of sunstroke as the doctor's certificate attested true in all the history of tahiti no one had ever died of sunstroke but it was that precisely that which made the death of this chinago unique the doctor said as much in his report he was very candid dividends must be paid or else one more failure would be added to the long history of failure in tahiti there was no understanding these white devils acho pondered their inscrutableness as he sat in the courtroom waiting the judgment there was no telling what went on at the back of their minds he had seen a few of the white devils they were all alike the officers and sailors on the ship the french officials the several white men on the plantation including shemmer their minds all moved in mysterious ways there was no getting at they grew angry without apparent cause and their anger was always dangerous they were like wild beasts at such times they worried about little things and on occasion could outtoil even a chinago they were not temperate as chinagos were temperate they were gluttons eating prodigiously and drinking more prodigiously a chinago never knew when an act would please them or arouse a storm of wrath a chinago could never tell what pleased one time the very next time might provoke an outburst of anger there was a curtain behind the eyes of the white devils that screened the backs of their minds from the chinago's gaze and then on top of it all was that terrible efficiency of the white devils that ability to do things to make things go to work results to bend to their wills all creeping crawling things and the powers of the very elements themselves 
Yes, the white men were strange and wonderful, and they were devils. Look at Shemmer. Acho wondered why the judgment was so long in forming. Not a man on trial had laid hand on Chunga. Asan alone had killed him. Asan had done it, bending Chunga's head back with one hand by a grip of his cue, and with the other hand from behind, reaching over and driving the knife into his body. Twice he had driven it in. There, in the courtroom with closed eyes, Acho saw the killing acted over again, the squabble, the vile words bandied back and forth, the filth and insult flung upon venerable ancestors, the curses laid upon unbegotten generations, the leap of Asan, the grip on the cue of Chunga, the knife that sank twice into his flesh, the bursting open of the door, the eruption of Shemmer, the dash for the door, the escape of Asan, the flying belt of Shemmer that drove the rest into the corner, and the firing of the revolver as a signal that brought help to Shemmer. Acho shivered as he lived it over. One blow of the belt had bruised his cheek, taking off some of the skin. Shemmer had pointed to the bruises when, on the witness stand, he had identified Acho. It was only just now that the marks had become no longer visible. That had been a blow. Half an inch nearer the center, and it would have taken out his eye. Then Acho forgot the whole happening in a vision he caught of the garden of meditation and repose that would be his when he returned to his own land. He sat with impassive face while the magistrate rendered the judgment. Likewise were the faces of his four companions impassive, and they remained impassive when the interpreter explained that the five of them had been found guilty of the murder of Chunga and that Ah Chow should have his head cut off. Ah Cho served twenty years in prison in New Caledonia. Wang Li twelve years, and Ah Tong ten years. There was no use in getting excited about it. Even Ah Chow remained expressionless as a mummy, though it was his head that was to be cut off. The magistrate added a few words, and the interpreter explained that Ah Chow's face, having been the most severely bruised by Shemmer's strap, had made his identification so positive that since one man must die, he might as well be that man. Also, the fact that Ah Cho's face likewise had been severely bruised, conclusively proving his presence at the murder and his undoubted participation, had merited him the twenty years of penal servitude, and down to the ten years of Ah Tong, the proportioned reason for each sentence was explained. Let the China ghosts take the lesson to heart, the court said finally, for they must learn that the law would be fulfilled in Tahiti, though the heavens fall. The five China ghosts were taken back to jail. They were not shocked nor grieved. The sentences being unexpected was quite what they were accustomed to in their dealings with the white devils. From them, a Chinago rarely expected more than the unexpected. The heavy punishment for a crime they had not committed was no stranger than the countless strange things that white devils did. In the weeks that followed, Ah Cho often contemplated Ah Chow with mild curiosity. His head was to be cut off by the guillotine that was being erected on the plantation. For him, there would be no declining years, no gardens of tranquility. Ah Cho philosophized and speculated about life and death. As for himself, he was not perturbed. Twenty years was merely twenty years. By that much was his garden removed from him, that was all. He was young, and the patience of Asia was in his bones. He could wait those twenty years, and by that time the heats of his blood would be assuaged and he would be better fitted for that garden of calm delight. He thought of a name for it. He would call it the Garden of the Morning Calm. He was made happy all day by the thought and he was inspired to devise a moral maxim on the virtue of patience, which maxim proved a great comfort, especially to Wang Li and Ah Tong. Ah Chow, however, did not care for the maxim. His head was to be separated from his body in so short a time that he had no need for patience to wait for that event. He smoked well, ate well, slept well, and did not worry about the slow passage of time. Cruchot was a gendarme. He had seen twenty years of service in the colonies from Nigeria and Senegal to the South Seas, and those twenty years had not perceptibly brightened his dull mind. He was as slow-witted and stupid as in his peasant days in the south of France. He knew discipline and fear of authority, and from God down to the sergeant of gendarmes the only difference to him was the measure of slavish obedience which he rendered. In point of fact, the sergeant bulked bigger in his mind than God, except on Sundays when God's mouthpieces had their say. God was usually very remote, while the sergeant was ordinarily very close at hand. Cruchot it was who received the order from the chief justice to the jailer, commanding that functionary to deliver over to Cruchot the person of Ah Chow. Now it happened that the chief justice had given a dinner the night before to the captain and officers of the French man-o'-war. 
His hand was shaking when he wrote out the order, and his eyes were aching so dreadfully that he did not read over the order. It was only a China ghost life he was signing away, anyway, so he did not notice that he had omitted the final letter in Ah Chow's name. The order read Ah Cho, and when Cruchot presented the order, the jailer turned over to him the person of Ah Cho. Cruchot took that person beside him on the seat of a wagon, behind two mules, and drove away. Ah Cho was glad to be out in the sunshine. He sat beside the gendarme and beamed. He beamed more ardently than ever when he noted the mules headed south toward Ati Maono. Undoubtedly Shemmer had sent for him to be brought back. Shemmer wanted him to work. Very well, he would work well. Shemmer would never have cause to complain. It was a hot day. There had been a stoppage of the trades. The mules sweated, Crucio sweated, and Ah Cho sweated. But it was Ah Cho that bore the heat with the least concern. He had toiled three years under that sun on the plantation. He beamed and beamed with such genial good nature that even Cruchot's heavy mind was stirred to wonderment. "'You are very funny,' he said at last. Ah Cho nodded and beamed more ardently. Unlike the magistrate, Cruchot spoke to him in the Kanaka tongue, and this, like all Chinagos and all foreign devils, Ah Cho understood. "'You laugh too much,' Cruchot chided. "'One's heart should be full of tears on a day like this.' I'm glad to get out of the jail. Is that all? The gendarme shrugged his shoulders. Is it not enough? was the retort. Then you are not glad to have your head cut off? Ah Cho looked at him in abrupt perplexity and said, Why, I am going back to Atimaono to work on the plantation for Shemmer. Are you not taking me to Atimaono? Cruchot stroked his long moustaches reflectively. Well, well, he said finally with a flick of the whip at the off mule. So you don't know. No, what? Ah Cho was beginning to feel a vague alarm. Won't Shemmer let me work for him any more? Not after today, Cruchot laughed heartily. It was a good joke. You see, you won't be able to work after today. A man with his head cut off can't work, eh? He poked the Chinago in the ribs and chuckled. Ah Cho maintained silence while the mules trotted a hot mile. Then he spoke. Is Shemmer going to cut off my head? Cruchot grinned as he nodded. It is a mistake, said Ah Cho gravely. I am not the China Go that was to have his head cut off. I am Ah Cho. The honorable judge has determined that I am to stop twenty years in New Caledonia. The gendarme laughed. It was a good joke, this funny China Go trying to cheat the guillotine. The mules trotted through a coconut grove, and for half a mile beside the sparkling sea, before Ah Cho spoke again. I tell you, I am not Ah Chow. The honorable judge did not say that my head was to go off. Don't be afraid, said Cruchot, with the philanthropic intention of making it easier for his prisoner. It is not difficult to die in that way. He snapped his fingers. It is quick, like that. It is not like hanging on the end of a rope and kicking and making faces for five minutes. It is like killing a chicken with a hatchet. You cut its head off, that is all. And it is the same with a man. Poof, it is over. It doesn't hurt. You don't even think it hurts. You don't think. Your head is gone, so you cannot think. It is very good. That is the way I want to die. Quick, ah, quick. You are lucky to die that way. You might get the leprosy and fall to pieces slowly a finger at a time, and now and again a thumb, also the toes. I knew a man who was burned by hot water. It took him two days to die. You could hear him yelling a kilometer away. But you, ah, so easy. Chick, the knife cut your neck like that. It is finished. The knife may even tickle. Who can say? Nobody who died that way ever came back to say... He considered this last an excruciating joke and permitted himself to be convulsed with laughter for half a minute. Part of his mirth was assumed, but he considered it his humane duty to cheer up the China go. But I tell you, I am Ah Cho, the other persisted. I don't want my head cut off. Cruchot scowled. The China go was carrying the foolishness too far. I am not Ah Chow, Ah Cho began. That will do, the gendarme interrupted. He puffed up his cheeks and strove to appear fierce. I tell you, I am not, Ah Cho began again. Shut up, bawled Cruchot. After that, they rode along in silence. It was twenty miles from Papiti to Atamaono, and over half the distance was covered by the time the China Go again ventured into speech. I saw you in the courtroom when the honorable judge sought after our guilt, he began. Very good. And do you remember that Ah Chow, whose head is to be cut off, do you remember that he, Ah Chow, was a tall man? Look at me. He stood up suddenly, and Cruchot saw that he was a short man. 
and just as suddenly Cruchot caught a glimpse of a memory picture of Ah Chow, and in that picture Ah Chow was tall. To the gendarme all Chinagos looked alike. One face was like another. But between tallness and shortness he could differentiate, and he knew that he had the wrong man beside him on the seat. He pulled up the mules abruptly, so that the pole shot ahead of them, elevating their collars. You see, it was a mistake, said Ah Cho, smiling pleasantly. But Cruchot was thinking. Already he regretted that he had stopped the wagon. He was unaware of the error of the Chief Justice, and he had no way of working it out. But he did know that he had been given this China go to take to Atimaono, and that it was his duty to take him to Atimaono. What if he was the wrong man and they cut his head off? It was only a China go when all was said, and what was a China go anyway? Besides, it might not be a mistake. He did not know what went on in the minds of his superiors. They knew their business best. Who was he to do their thinking for them? Once in the long ago he had attempted to think for them, and the sergeant had said, Cruchot, you are a fool. The quicker you know that, the better you will get on. You are not to think, you are to obey, and leave thinking to your betters. He smarted under the recollection. Also, if he turned back to Papiti, he would delay the execution at Atimaono and if he were wrong in turning back, he would get a reprimand from the sergeant who was waiting for the prisoner, and furthermore he would get a reprimand at Papiti as well. He touched the mules with the whip and drove on. He looked at his watch. He would be half an hour late as it was, and the sergeant was bound to be angry. He put the mules into a faster trot. The more Acho persisted in explaining the mistake, the more stubborn Cruchot became. The knowledge that he had the wrong man did not make his temper better. The knowledge that it was through no mistake of his confirmed him in the belief that the wrong he was doing was right, and rather than incur the displeasure of the sergeant, he would willingly have assisted a dozen wrong Chinagos to their doom. As for Ah Cho, after the gendarme had struck him over the head with the butt of the whip and commanded him in a loud voice to shut up, there remained nothing for him to do but to shut up. The long ride continued in silence. Ah Cho pondered the strange ways of the foreign devils. There was no explaining them. What they were doing with him was a piece with everything they did. First they found guilty five innocent men, and next they cut off the head of the man who, even they, in their benighted ignorance, had deemed meritorious of no more than twenty years' imprisonment. And there was nothing he could do. He could only sit idly and take what these lords of life measured out to him. Once he got in a panic, and the sweat upon his body turned cold. But he fought his way out of it. He endeavored to resign himself to his fate by remembering and repeating certain passages from the Yin Chi Wen, the tract of the quiet way. But instead, he kept seeing his dream garden of meditation and repose. This bothered him until he abandoned himself to the dream and sat in his garden listening to the tinkling of the wind bells in the several trees. And lo, sitting thus in the dream, he was able to remember and repeat the passages from the tract of the quiet way. So the time passed nicely until Atimaono was reached, and the mules trotted up to the foot of the scaffold, in the shade of which stood the impatient sergeant. Acho was hurried up the ladder of the scaffold. Beneath him, on one side, he saw assembled all the coolies of the plantation. Shemmer had decided that the event would be a good object lesson, and so had called in the coolies from the field and compelled them to be present. As they caught sight of Acho, they gabbled among themselves in low voices. They saw the mistake, but they kept it to themselves. The inexplicable white devils had doubtlessly changed their minds. Instead of taking the life of one innocent man, they were taking the life of another innocent man. Ah Chow or Ah Chow, what did it matter which? They could never understand the white dogs any more than could the white dogs understand them. Ah Chow was going to have his head cut off, but they, when their two remaining years of servitude were up, were going back to China. Shemmer had made the guillotine himself. He was a handy man, and though he had never seen a guillotine, the French officials had explained the principle to him. It was on his suggestion that they had ordered the execution to take place at Atimaono instead of at Papiti. The scene of the crime, Shemmer had argued, was the best possible place for the punishment, and in addition, it would have a salutary influence upon the half-thousand Chinagos on the plantation. Shemmer had also volunteered to act as executioner, and in that capacity he was now on the scaffold, experimenting with the instrument he had made. A banana tree of the size and consistency of a man's neck lay under the guillotine. Ah Cho watched with fascinated eyes. The German, turning a small crank, hoisted the blade to the top of the little derrick he had rigged. 
a jerk on a stout piece of cord loosed the blade and it dropped with a flash neatly severing the banana trunk how does it work the sergeant coming out on top of the scaffold had asked the question beautifully was schemmer's exultant answer let me show you again he turned to the crank that hoisted the blade jerked the cord and sent the blade crashing down on the soft tree but this time it went no more than two-thirds of the way through the sergeant scowled that will not serve he said schemmer wiped the sweat from his forehead what it needs is more weight he announced walking up to the edge of the scaffold he called his orders to the blacksmith for a twenty-five pound piece of iron as he stooped over to attach the iron to the broad top of the blade ah cho glanced at the sergeant and saw his opportunity the honorable judge said that ah chow was to have his head cut off he began the sergeant nodded impatiently he was thinking of the fifteen-mile ride before him that afternoon to the windward side of the island and of bertha the pretty half-caste daughter of la Fier, the pearl trader who was waiting for him at the end of it well i am not ah chow i am ah cho the honorable jailer has made a mistake ah chow is a tall man and you see i am short the sergeant looked at him hastily and saw the mistake schemmer he called imperatively come here the german grunted but remained bent over his task till the chunk of iron was lashed to his satisfaction is your china go ready he demanded look at him was the answer is he the china go schemmer was surprised he swore tersely for a few seconds and looked regretfully across at the thing he had made with his own hands and which he was eager to see work look here he said finally we can't postpone this affair i've lost three hours work already out of those five hundred china goes i can't afford to lose it all over again for the right man let's put the performance through just the same it is only a china go the sergeant remembered the long ride before him and the pearl trader's daughter and debated with himself they will blame it on cruchot if it is discovered the german urged but there's little chance of it being discovered ah chow won't give it away at any rate the blame won't lie with cruchot anyway the sergeant said it must have been the jailer's mistake then let's go on with it they can't blame us who can tell one china go from another we can say that we merely carried out instructions with the china go that was turned over to us besides i really can't take all these coolies a second time away from their labor they spoke in french and ah cho who did not understand a word of it nevertheless knew that they were determining his destiny he knew also that the decision rested with the sergeant and he hung upon that official's lips all right announced the sergeant go ahead with it he is only a china go i'm going to try it once more just to make sure schemmer moved the banana trunk forward under the knife which he had hoisted to the top of the derrick ah cho tried to remember maxims from the tract of the quiet way live in concord came to him but it was not applicable he was not going to live he was about to die no that would not do forgive malice yes but there was no malice to forgive schemmer and the rest were doing this thing without malice it was to them merely a piece of work that had to be done just as clearing the jungle ditching the water and planting cotton were pieces of work that had to be done schemmer jerked the cord and Acho forgot the tract of the quiet way the knife shot down with a thud making a clean slice of the tree beautiful exclaimed the sergeant pausing in the act of lighting a cigarette beautiful my friend schemmer was pleased at the praise come on ah chow he said in the tahitian tongue but i am not ah chow ah cho began shut up was the answer if you open your mouth again i'll break your head the overseer threatened him with a clenched fist and he remained silent what was the good of protesting these foreign devils always had their way he allowed himself to be lashed to the vertical board that was the size of his body schemmer drew the buckles tight so tight that the straps cut into his flesh and hurt but he did not complain the hurt would not last long he felt the board tilting over in the air toward the horizontal and closed his eyes and in that moment he caught a last glimpse of his garden of meditation and repose it seemed to him that he sat in the garden a cool wind was blowing and the bells in the several trees were tinkling softly also birds were making sleepy noises and from beyond the high wall came the subdued sound of village life then he was aware that the board had come to rest and from muscular pressures and tensions he knew that he was lying on his back he opened his eyes straight above him he saw the suspended knife blazing in the sunshine he saw the weight which had been added and noted that one of schemmer's knots had slipped then he heard the sergeant's voice in sharp command 
Ah Cho closed his eyes hastily. He did not want to see that knife descend, but he felt it for one great fleeting instant, and in that instant he remembered Cruchot and what Cruchot had said. But Cruchot was wrong. The knife did not tickle. That much he knew before he ceased to know. End of The China Go by Jack London Recording by Colleen McMahon The Civil Service in Florida From Cobwebs from an Empty Skull by Ambrose Bierce Writing as Dodd Grill This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman The Civil Service in Florida by Dodd Grill Colonel Pulper was of a slumberous turn. Most people are not. They work all day and sleep all night, and are always in one or the other condition of unrest, and never slumber. Such persons, the colonel used to remark, are fit only for sentry duty. They are good to watch our property while we take our rest, and they take the property. But this tale is not of them. It is of Colonel Bulper. There was a fellow named Halsey, a practical joker, and one of the most disagreeable of his class. He would remain broad awake for a year at a time, for no other purpose than to break other people of their natural rest. And I must admit that from the wreck of his faculties upon the rock of insomnia, he had somehow rescued a marvelous ingenuity and fertility of expedient. But this tale is not so much of him as of Colonel Bulper. At the time of which I write, the Colonel was the collector of customs at a seaport town in Florida. United States. The climate there is perpetual summer. It never rains, nor anything, and there was no good reason why the Colonel should not have enjoyed it to the top of his bent, as there was enough for all. In point of fact, the collectorship had been given him solely that he might repair his wasted vitality by a short season of unbroken repose, for during the presidential canvass immediately preceding his appointment, he had been kept awake for a long time by means of strong tea, in order to deliver an able and exhaustive political argument prepared by the candidate, who was ultimately successful in spite of it. Halsey, who had favored the other aspirant, was a merchant, and had nothing in the world to do but annoy the collector. If the latter could be kept away from him, the dignity of the office might have been preserved, and the object of the incumbent's appointment to it attained. But sneak away whithersoever he might, into the heart of the dismal swamp, or anywhere in the Everglades, some vagrom Indian or casual negro was sure to stumble over him before long, and go and tell Halsey, securing a plug of tobacco for reward. Or, if he were not found in this way, some company was tolerably certain, in the course of time, to survey a line of railway athwart his leafy couch, and laying his prostrate trunk aside out of the way, send word to his persecutor, who, as soon as the line was as nearly completed as it ever would be, would come down on horseback with some diabolical device for waking the slumberer. I will confess that there is a subtle seeming of unlikelihood about all this, but in a land where Ponce de Leon searched for the fountain of youth, there is an air of unreality in everything. I can only say I had the story by me a long time, and it seems to me just as true as it was the day I wrote it. Sometimes the colonel would seek out a hillside with a southern exposure, but no sooner would he compose his members for a bit of slumber than Halsey would set about making inquiries for him, under pretense that a ship was en route from Liverpool, and the collector's signature might be required for her anchoring papers. Having traced him, 
which, owing to the meddlesome treachery of the venal natives, he was always able to do, Halsey would set off to Texas for a seed of a prickly pear, which he would plant exactly beneath the slumberer's body. This he called a triumph of modern engineering. As soon as the young vegetable had pushed its spines above the soil, of course the colonel would have to get up and seek another spot and this nearly always waked him. Upon one occasion the colonel existed five consecutive days without slumber, traveling all day and sleeping in the weeds at night, to find an almost inaccessible crag on the summit of which he hoped to be undisturbed until the action of the dew should wear away the rock all around his body, when he expected, and was willing, to roll off and wake. But even there Halsey found him out, and put eagle's eggs in his southern pocket to hatch. When the young birds were well grown, they pecked so sharply at the colonel's legs that he had to give up and wring their necks. The malevolence of people who scorn slumber seems to be practically unlimited. At last the colonel resolved upon revenge, and having dreamed out a feasible plan, proceeded to put it into execution. He had, in the warehouse, some government powder, and causing a keg of this to be conveyed into his private office, he knocked out the head. He next penned a note to Halsey, asking him to step down to the office, upon important business, adding in a postscript, As I am liable to be called out for a few moments at any time, in case you do not find me in, please sit down and amuse yourself with the newspaper until I return. He knew Halsey was in his counting-house, and would certainly come if only to learn what signification a government official attached to the word business. Then the colonel procured a brief candle and set it into the powder. His plan was to light the candle dispatch a porter with the message, and bolt for home. Having completed his preparations, he leaned back in his easy chair and smiled. He smiled a long time, and even achieved a chuckle. For the first time in his life, he felt a serene sense of happiness in being particularly wide awake. Then, without moving from his chair, he ignited the taper, and put out his hand toward the bell cord to summon the porter. At this stage of his vengeance, the colonel fell into a tranquil and refreshing slumber. There is nothing omitted here. That is merely the colonel's present address. End of the Civil Service in Florida by Dodd Grill The Fox and the Crow by George T. Lanigan From Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman The Fox and the Crow by George T. Lanigan A crow, having secured a piece of cheese, flew with its prize to a lofty tree, and was preparing to devour the luscious morsel, when a crafty fox, halting at the foot of the tree, began to cast about for how he might obtain it. "'How tasteful is your dress!' he cried, in willful feigned ecstasy. "'It cannot surely be that your musical education has been neglected. Will you not oblige?' I have a horrid cold, replied the crow, and never sing without my music. But since you press me, at the same time I should add that I have read Aesop and been there before. So saying, she deposited the cheese in a safe place on the limb of the tree, and favored him with a song. Thank you, exclaimed the fox, trotting away, with a remark that Welsh rabbits never agreed with him and were far inferior in quality to the animated variety. 
Moral. The foregoing fable is supported by a whole gatling battery of morals. We are taught, one, that it pays to take the papers. Two, that invitation is not always the sincerest flattery. Three, that a stalled rabbit with contentment is better than no bread. And four, that the aim of art is to conceal disappointment. The End of The Fox and the Crow by George T. Lanigan How to Tame a Turbulent Husband An Anecdote from the Fifteenth Century by Anonymous from the Ladies' Companion, 1836-1837. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A tradesman who lived in a village near St. Albans had been twice married and ill-treated his wives so as to cause their death he sought a third but as his brutality was well known in the place where he dwelt he was obliged to go fifty miles off for a wife he obtained one and after he brought her home all the neighbors came to visit her and acquaint her in what manner her husband used to treat his former wives this somewhat surprised her but she resolved to wait patiently till her lord and master should take it into his head to beat her she did not wait long for her husband was a terrible fellow one morning he waited on his lady with a cudgel and was preparing himself to make use of it stop said she i fancy that the right which you now pretend to have over me is not mentioned in the marriage contract i declare to your worship you shall not exercise it such a distinct speech disconcerted her husband so much that he laid down his cudgel and only began to scold her get out of my house said he and let us share our goods readily she said and i am willing to leave you and each began to set aside the movables the lady loosens the curtains and the gentleman unlocks an enormous trunk to fill it with his property but as he was leaning over to place some articles at the bottom she tripped up his heels pushed him in and locked the lid never was man in a greater passion than our hero he threatened to kill her and made more noise than a wild boar caught in a trap she answered him very quietly my dear friend pray be calm your passion may injure your health refresh yourself a little in this comfortable trunk for i love you too much to let you out now you are so outrageous in the meantime she ordered her maid to make some custards and cream tarts and when these were baked and ready she sent round to all the neighboring gossips to come and partake of her collation this was served up not on a table but on the lid of the trunk heaven knows what pretty things the husband heard all these famous tattlers publish in his praise in such a case a wise man must submit and give fair words so did our friend in the chest his language was soothing he begged pardon and cried for mercy the ladies were so good as to forgive him and let him out of the trunk to reward him for his good behavior they handed him the remainder of the tarts he was thus completely cured of his brutality and was afterwards cited as a model for good husbands so it was sufficient to say to those who were not so take care of the trunk to make them like himself as gentle as lambs end of how to tame a turbulent husband an anecdote of the fifteenth century from the ladies companion eighteen thirty six and eighteen thirty seven
Karma from Japanese Fairy Tales by Grace James. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. Karma from Japanese Fairy Tales by Grace James. A young man, Ido Tadawaki, was returning homeward after a journey which he had taken to the city of Kyoto. He made his way alone and on foot, and he went with his eyes bent upon the ground, for cares weighed him down, and his mind was full of the business which had taken him to Kyoto. Night found him upon a lonely road leading across a wild moor. Upon the moor were rocks and stones, with an abundance of flowers. For it was summer time, and here and there grew a great pine tree with gnarled trunk and crooked boughs. Tatawaki looked up and beheld the figure of a woman before him in the way. It was a slender girl dressed in a simple gown of blue cotton. Lightly she went along the lonely road in the deepening twilight. I should say she is a serving maid of some gentle woman, Tatawaki said to himself. The way is solitary, and the time is dreary for such a child as she. So the young man quickened his pace and came up with the maiden. Child, he said very gently, since we tread the same lonely path, let us be fellow travelers. For now the twilight passes, and it will soon be dark. The pretty maid turned to him with bright eyes and smiling lips. Sir, she said, my mistress will be glad indeed. Your mistress, said Tatawaki. Why, sir, of a surety she will be glad because you are come. Because I am come? Indeed, and indeed, the time has been long, said the serving maid. But now she will think no more of that. Will she not? said Tatawaki. And on he went by the maid's side, walking as one in a dream. Presently the two of them came to a little house, not far from the roadside. Before the house was a small, fair garden, with a stream running through it and a stone bridge. About the house and the garden was a bamboo fence and in the fence a wicker gate. Here dwells my mistress, said the serving maid, and they went into the garden through the wicker gate. Now Tatawaki came to the threshold of the house. He saw a lady standing upon the threshold waiting. She said, You have come at last, my lord, to give me comfort. And he answered, I have come. When he had said this, he knew that he loved the lady, and had loved her since love was. Oh, love, love, he murmured, time is not for such as we. Then she took him by the hand, and they went into the house together, and into a room with white mats and a round latticed window. Before the window there stood a lily in a vessel of water. There the two held converse together. And after some time, there was an old, ancient woman that came with sake in a silver flagon, and she brought silver drinking cups, and all things needful. And Tatawaki and the lady drank the three times three together. When they had done this, the lady said, Love, let us go out into the shine of the moon. See, the night is as green as an emerald. So they went and left the house and the small fair garden behind them. Or ever they had closed the wicker gate, the house and the garden and the wicker gate itself all faded away, dissolving in a faint mist. Not a sign of them was left. Alas, what is this? cried Tatawaki. Let it be, dear love, said the lady, and smiled. They pass, for we have no need of them. 
Then Tatawaki saw that he was alone with the lady upon a wild moor. And the tall lilies grew around them in a ring. So they stood the livelong night, not touching one another, but looking into each other's eyes most steadfastly. When the dawn came, the lady stirred and gave one deep sigh. Tatawaki said, Lady, why do you sigh? And when he asked her this, she unclasped her girdle, which was fashioned after the form of a golden-scaled dragon with translucent eyes. And she took the girdle and wound it nine times about her love's arm. And she said, O oh, love, we part. These are the years until we meet again. So she touched the golden circles on his arm. Then Tatawaki cried aloud, O oh, love, who are you? Tell me your name. She said, O oh, love, what have we to do with names, you and I? I go to my people upon the plains. Do not seek for me there. Wait for me. When the lady had spoken, she faded slowly and grew wreathful, like a mist. And Tatawaki cast himself upon the ground and put out his hand to hold her sleeve. But he could not stay her. And his hand grew cold, and he lay still as one dead, all in the gray dawn. When the sun was up, he rose. The plains, he said, the low plains. There will I find her. So, with the golden token wound about his arm, fleeting, he sped down, down to the plains. He came to a broad river, where he saw folk standing on the green banks, and on the river there floated boats of fresh flowers, the red dianthus and the campanula, goldenrod and meadow sweet. And the people upon the river banks called to Tatawaki. Stay with us. Last night was the night of souls. They came to earth and wandered where they would. The kind wind carried them. Today they return to Yomi. They go in their boats of flowers, and the river bears them. Stay with us, and bid the departing souls good speed. And Tatawaki cried, May the souls have sweet passage. I cannot stay. So he came to the plains at last, but did not find his lady. Nothing at all did he find but a wilderness of ancient graves with nettles overgrown and waving green grass. So Tatawaki went to his own place, and for nine long years he lived a lonely man. The happiness of home and little children he never knew. Ah, love, he said. Not patiently, not patiently I wait for you. Love, delay not your coming. And when the nine years had passed, he was in his garden upon the night of souls. And looking up, he saw a woman that came toward him, threading her way through the paths of the garden. Lightly she came. She was a slender girl, dressed in a simple gown of blue cotton. Tatawaki stood up and spoke. Child, he said very gently, since we tread the same lonely road, let us be fellow travelers. For now the twilight passes, and it will soon be dark. The maid turned to him with bright eyes and smiling lips. Sir, she said, my mistress will be glad indeed. Will she be glad? said Tatawaki. The time has been long. Long and very weary, said Tatawaki. But now you will think no more of that. Take me to your mistress, said Tatawaki. Guide me, for I cannot see any more. Hold me, for my limbs fail. Do not leave go my hand, for I am afraid. Take me to your mistress, said Tatawaki. The End of Karma by Grace Jane
Love and Advertising by Richard Walton Tully. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. Love and Advertising by Richard Walton Tully. I do not demand, said Mr. Pepper. I simply suggest a change. If you wish me to resign, his self-deprecating manner bespoke an impossible supposition. Very well, but if you see fit to find me a new assistant, he paused with an interrogatory cough. It was the senior partner who answered, We shall consider the matter. The advertising manager's lean face took on an expression of satisfaction. He bowed and disappeared through the door. Young Kaufman, the junior partner, smiled covertly. But the elder man's face bespoke keen disappointment, for it must be explained that Mr. Pepper's simple announcement bore vitally upon the only dissension that had ever visited the firm of Kaufman and Houghton during the thirty years of its existence. In 1875, when John Houghton, fresh from college, had come to visit New York to find his fortune, the elder Kaufman had been a candy manufacturer with a modest trade on the east side. Young Houghton had taken the agency of a glucose firm. The disposal of its products had brought the two together, with the result that a partnership had been formed to carry on a wholesale confectionery business. Success in this venture had led to new and more profitable ends, the chewing gum trade. The rise to wealth of these two was the result of the careful plotting of the German workmen who kept the K and H products up to an invariable standard, joined with the other's energy and acumen in marketing the output. And this mutual relationship had been disturbed by but one difference. When Houghton was disposed to consider a college man for a vacancy, Kaufman, who had always been ready with his practical man that has worked his way, and every time in respect to his wishes, Houghton had given in, reflecting that perhaps, as Kaufman said, it had been that he himself was a good businessman in spite of his college training, not because of it. And after all, college ideals had sunk since his time, and the college applicant had been sent away. Young Jonathan Kaufman graduated from grammar school. Houghton suggested high school and college. But nine, said the elder Kaufman, I show him how better the gum to make. And he did. He put on an apron, as of yore, and started his son under his personal supervision in the washing room. He took off his apron when Jonathan knew all about handling chickle products, from import bag to tinfoil wrapper. Then he died. And this year troublesome conditions had come on. The consolidated pepsin people were cutting in severely. Houghton, now senior partner, had proposed, and young Kaufman agreed, that an advertising expert be secured. But the agreement ended there, for the first words of the junior partner showed Houghton that the spirit of the father was still sitting at the desk opposite, and smiling that same fat, phlegmatic smile at his supposed weakness for those college business. They had compromised upon Mr. Pepper, secured from Simpkins' practical advertising school. But at the end of six months, Pepper's so-called follow-up campaign had failed to meet materially the steady inroads of the Western men. He had explained that it was the result of his need for an assistant. It was determined to give him one. Then, one night as he sat in his library, John Houghton had looked into a pair of blue eyes and promised to give Tom Brainerd the chance. In consequence, he had his hair tousled, been given a resounding kiss, and a crushing hug from the young lady on his knees. For Dorothy Houghton, despite her nineteen years, still claimed that privilege from her father. In that way, for the first time, a college man had come to be employed at K&H and been made an assistant to Mr. Pepper at the salary he demanded. Any old thing to start the ball rolling. 
and now had come the information that the senior partner's long-desired experiment had ended in failure. Young Kaufman turned to his work with the air of one who has given a child its own way and seen it come to grief. I... I suppose, said Hoffman slowly, we'll have to let Brainerd go. And then a peculiar thing happened. Through the open window, floating in the summer air, he seemed to see a familiar figure. It was dressed in fluffy white and carried a parasol over its shoulder. It fluttered calmly in, seated itself on the sill, and gazed at him with blue eyes that were serious, reproachful. Daddy, it said, and it brushed away a wisp of hair by its ear, just as another one long ago had used to. Daddy, it faltered, why did I ask you to give him a place if it wasn't because, because? The spell was broken by Kaufman's voice. Whatever you do, I am suited, he was saying. It might have been his father. But if what Pepper says about Brainot, the senior partner straightened up and pushed a button. Yes, but we haven't heard what Brainerd said about Pepper. Several moments later, Tom Brainerd entered. Medium-sized and muscled, he was dressed in a loose-fitting suit that by its very cut told his training. He stood between them as Mr. Pepper had done, but there was nothing of the other's ingratiating diffidence in his level look. Sit down, Brainerd, said Hooten. The newcomer did so, and the senior partner marked an attitude of laziness and indifference. Hooten became stern. Brainerd, he began, I gave you a chance with us because, he paused, the other colored. I had hoped to make good without that. But this morning, Mr. Pepper said we couldn't get along together. That's true. Ah, you admit it, said Kaufman. Yes. There was a pause. Then Hooten spoke. I can't tell you how much this disappoints me, Brainerd. The fact is, for years I have tried to shut my eyes to the development of college training. In my time, there was not the call for practicality that there is today. Yet it seems to me that the training in our colleges has grown less and less practical. Why do the colleges turn out men who spend their time in personal gossip over sport or trivialities? You remember that the king of Spain, or was it Cambodia, puzzled his wise men for a year as to why a fish, when dropped in a full pail of water, didn't make it overflow. What has that got to do with it? Because I must answer as the king did. It's not so. The pail does overflow. They hadn't thought to try it. You mean that I am wrong? Yes. Are you sure your gossips were college men? Ah, Hooten said with a gesture to his partner, who was about to speak. Then let us commence at the root of the matter. Mr. Kaufman and I have often discussed the subject. In this case, you are the one who has tried it. Suppose you explain our mistake. I'd be glad to do that, said Brainerd, because I've heard a lot of that talk. Well? Well, of course, when I say college man, I mean college graduate. Why? If a kitten crawls into an oven, is it a biscuit? There was an earnestness that robbed the question of any flippancy. Hooten laughed. No. If a dub does a college and gets flunked out in a month, is he a college man? Hardly. Oh, but he calls himself one. He goes to Podunk all decorated up with geraniums, and the rest of his life is a college man. I'm not talking about him or the man who comes to college to learn to mix cocktails inside. He may last to the junior year. I'm talking about the graduate. They're only about a tenth of the college, but they're the finished product. Mr. Kaufman, I wouldn't try to sell gum that had only gone as far as the rolling room, would you? What, me? Would you? No, the junior partner was puzzled. That's because you wanted to go through all the processes. Well, let's talk about the boy who has gone all the way through the man factory. 
Houghton nodded. That's fair. The trouble is, people don't do that. They persist in butting into the college world, jerking out some sophomore celebration, and saying, What is this silly thing in the real world? Well, aren't they right? No, that's just the point. The college world is a mimic world, and your lifetime is just four years. A sophomore celebration is a practical thing there. Perhaps it's teaching loyalty. That generally comes first. That's your college rolling room. But the graduate, he'd learn to do something well. I never knew a college man who wasn't at least responsible. But, but here's the trouble. After selecting, say, 200 fellows out of an entering bunch of 600 and developing the thing each is best fitted for, father steps in, and the boy who would make a first-class professor is put into business and blamed for being impractical. The fellow who has been handling thousands of dollars in college management and running 20 assistants, the man who could have taken the place, has no father to give him the boost necessary. And the other man's failure has queered his chances. He has to go to work as a mere clerk under a man. Excuse me. I don't want to do any knocking. You think the whole trouble is caused by misdirected nepotism? Yes. Ah, said young Poffman. But you say that you were trained in advertising on your college paper. Yes, and I was going to tell you today, if Mr. Pepper hadn't, that the money you're paying for me is utterly wasted. Ah. Yes, I can't look in the face of a hungry designer and beat him down to within a dollar of the cost of materials. And, and my suggestion on broader lines doesn't seem to cause much hurrah. Well, the junior partner set up, since you admit, he paused for his partner to speak to the words of discharge. But Hooten was looking quizzically at the college man. What was your idea as to broader lines? Brainerd hesitated. Well, it seems to me that Pepper is trying to do two things that are antagonistic. Be elite and sell chewing gum. The fact is that elite people don't chew gum. I'd like to know how the statement, Old Tulu, best by test, will make a kid on a corner with a cent in his fist have an attack of mouth-watering. Kaufman roused himself. It is true, our gum is the best. I'm not disputing that, but still, it's gum. If you're trying to increase the vulgar habit of gum-chewing, well, you can't do it by advertising the firm's financial standing, its age, or the purity of its output. That would do for an insurance company or a bank. But gum? Who cares for purity? All they want to know is if it's schmecking gut. This last, with a humorous glance at Kaufman. The latter was scowling. Brainerd was touching a tender spot. Well, what would you do? Brainerd flushed. He felt the tone of sarcasm in the elder man's voice. He tightened his lips. At least I'd change the name of the gum. Change the name? Goffman was horrified. Well, nobody wants old Tulu. They want new Tulu or fresh-tasting Tulu. At least something to appeal to the imagination of Sadie at the ribbon counter. Oh, observed Kaufman. And the name you suggest? Well, say something like Lulu Tulu. Gott! Kaufman struck the desk a blow with his fist. It was an insult to his father's memory. Brainerd rose. I'm sorry, he said, if I have offended. To save you any further bother, I'll just cut it out after Saturday. I thank you for the chance. He smiled a little ruefully. The chance you have given me. Good day, gentlemen. He turned on his heel and left the office. As John Houghton was driving home that night, he became suddenly conscious that he would soon meet the apparition of the afternoon in the flesh. And though, of course, there was no need, 
he found himself rehearsing the justification of his position. Lulu Tulu, indeed. Imagine the smile that would have illuminated the faces at the club on such an announcement. The impudence of the boy to have suggested it to him. Him, who had so often held forth upon the value of conservatism in business. And he remembered with pride the speaker who had once said, It is such solid vertebrae as John Hooten that formed the backbone of our business world. That speaker had been Bender, of the New York Dynamo Company. Poor Bender! The Western Electric Construction had got him after all. This line of thought caused Hooten to reach in his pocket and produce a letter. He went over the significant part again. Our Mr. Burns reports the clinching of the subway vending machine contract, it read and this together with our business will give us over half of the new york trade with this statement before us we feel that we can make a winning fight if you still refuse to consider our terms in view of recent developments we cannot repeat our former offer but if you will consider sixty seven as a figure sixty seven and a year before he would not have taken one hundred and ten in the bitterness of the moment he wondered if he too would finally go the way that bender had and then as the butler swung the door back he was recalled to the matter of tom brainard by the sight of a familiar figure that floated toward him as airily as it had its astral self that afternoon he kissed her and went to his study just before dinner was not a time to discuss such things but later as he looked across the candelabra at his daughter all smiles and happiness in that seat that had been her mother's he regretted that he had not for daddy dorothy was saying i've got such a funny note from tom this afternoon he said there had been a change at the office and that you will explain yes well she paused eagerly it's something awfully good i know her father frowned and caught her eye later he said significantly the girl read the tone, and the gaiety of the moment before was gone. After that they ate in silence. One cigar, two cigars, had been smoked when she stole into the library. Since coffee, whether from design or chance he never knew, she had rearranged her hair. Now it was low on her neck in the fashion of long ago, with a single curl that strayed over the white shoulder to her bosom. She knelt at his side without a word. He looked down at her. Somehow he had never seen her like this before, that curious womanly expression. Tell me, was all she said. And as he told Tom Brainerd's failure to fit in, he watched her closely. I'm sorry, he concluded. So am I, Daddy, she returned steadily, because I'm going to marry him what oh you knew you must have she said when i ask you to give him the chance the father was silent in fancy he again heard dorothy warner promising against her parents advice to wait for her john to get on in the world well he said do you think you've given him a fair chance he was restored to his usual poise I suppose he'd complain that I didn't. Dorothy's eyes went wild. No, he said that after I had heard the news from you, he would leave everything to me. Oh, but, Father, I don't think you've been fair. Tom is right. I don't chew gum, do I? Well, he said indignantly. Then he stopped thoughtfully. No. But Mary downstairs does. She wouldn't be offended by Lulu Tulu. I dare say she'd think it was just grand. He returned no answer. Come, Daddy, she went on. New York has grown lots ever since I was little. And, and some people get behind the times. They think they're being dignified when it's only that they're antiquated. He looked shrewdly at her. I've never heard you talk like that before. Where did you? 
Tom said that a week ago, she admitted. And he said, too, that he could double the results if he only had full swing. Instead, you admit he's a mere clerk to that horrid Pepper. Oh, Daddy, Daddy, she pleaded. Give him a chance. Then her voice went low again. I'm going to marry him anyway, she said, and you don't want this between. If he fails, I'll stand the loss from what Mother left me. Give him full swing. A real chance, Daddy. He's going to be your son. John Hooten looked into the earnest, girlish face. He wound the curl around his finger. Kaufman has always wanted to visit the fatherland, he said irrelevantly. She gave a quick, eager look. And that Pepper could go on vacation. Days drag very slowly at a summer resort, especially when one has promised not to write to him. But Dorothy's father had kept his word, so she could but do the same. Besides, in the sweltering city, in full charge for six weeks, was Tom Brainerd. His authority included permission to invent and use any new labels or trademarks he saw fit. The girl at the seashore, however, was also busy, amusing her father that he might not give too much time to thinking. And then, when three of the six weeks had passed, came the accident to the motor car. She was told that, with rest and no worries, her father would recover in a week or two. She cheerfully fitted into the role of assistant to the nurse in charge, and, as soon as the doctor allowed, prepared to read his mail to him, as he lay, eyes and head bandaged. But as she opened and glanced over the accumulated letters, she suddenly went pale. She read one in particular from end to end, and then, with a scared, furtive look at the bandaged figure, slipped it into a pocket. Later. When her father had finished dictating to her, she answered the concealed letter herself. Again the days drifted. The bandages were removed, but still the girl continued to scan the mail. Her vigilance was rewarded. She flushed over a second letter which, with one in a worn envelope, she took to her father. He saw the careworn expression. My little girl has been overworked, he said. She held out the worn letter. I had this for some time, but, but, I waited for something more, and here it is. She showed the other. He took the first, and when he had finished, his hand was trembling. I regret to report that things are in chaos, it ran. All of the regular advertising has been withdrawn. The usual entertainment money for salesmen classed under this head has been stopped. In consequence, our city trade has tumbled fearfully, and you know how bad it was before. The worst news I have to offer is in regard to Mr. Brainerd personally. Our detective reports that his time outside is spent in the most questionable company. He has been seen drinking at roof gardens with a certain dissipated pugilist named Little Sullivan, and was traced with this man to the apartment of a song-and-dance woman named Violetta. He seems to be spending money extravagantly, and visits certain bohemian quarters in the vicinity of Jones Street, where he puts in his time with disreputable-looking men. I beg leave to advise immediate action. Mowbray. My God, groaned Houghton. This explained that derisive offer of fifty-one from Consolidated Pepsin. And you kept this from me? They said not to worry you, she said. I, I've had enough for two. Besides, I answered it. You did? What? I told them to wait a little longer. The father groaned again. I just had to, Daddy. And then today this letter came. He seized it eagerly. It read, You were right about waiting. Suspend all action. What does it mean? she asked. We'll find out tomorrow, he answered grimly. The 4.30 train gave John Hooten just time to reach the office before it closed. Dorothy went home. Her father, roused by the evil news of the day before, 
had impressed her with all that it might mean in a material way. As though that mattered, as though anything could hurt her more. She would have been willing to go with Tom Brainerd in rags before, but now she sat by the telephone with clenched fists, her traveling veil still pushed up on her hat. The lines that had come into her face during the past week deepened with the dust. At last, a long, sharp ring. Yes, father. Not dine at home. Meet you at Yolan. A guest. Yes, but about Tom. What? 7.30. But about Tom, Dad. Goodbye. But Daddy. It was no use. He had hung up. She called feverishly for the office, but the reply was, they do not answer. Mechanically, she went up to her room. The blue mousseline, Susan, she said. As the maid laid it out, she walked the floor. Through the window, the park lay green and inviting. She longed to fly to the cool grass and run and run. From below came the loud, rasping notes of a street piano that, in some incomprehensible fashion, had wandered to the deserted row of houses. The noise, for all that there was a pleasing swing in the air, irritated her. She threw the man a quarter. Go away, she waved. At last the maid said her mistress was ready, and Dorothy, without questioning the decision, allowed herself to be put into the brougham. The drive seemed hours long. Then her father's face told her nothing. Without a word he led her to the reception room. As they entered, a figure sprang to meet them. For a moment she hesitated. Then, Tom, she cried, and caught his hand. He saw the whiteness of her face, and all the yearnings of their separation matched it upon his. Dorothy, he faltered. Her father interrupted. Tom is to explain how he has quadrupled our business in the last week. A sudden weakness seized her. She followed them unsteadily. Seated at the table, however, she was able to smile again. At that moment the orchestra struck up and suddenly caught her attention. Tum, ta tum, tum, ta tum, tum, that haunting, swinging melody of the street piano. What tune is that? she asked. Brainerd smiled. That is a tune that has suddenly become popular. Any night you might see hundreds of East Side children dancing on the asphalt and singing it. Yes, she said. I heard it on a street piano. It's called, he went on, My Lulu Tulu Girl. All the grinders have it. Bill Tompkins, Naughty Three, who lives in the Jones Street Social Development, worked that for me. Those dagos worship him. Saved a kid's life or something. A light came into John Houghton's eyes. That's part of the scheme. Aswell wrote the song. I found him down in Bohemia working on an opera. But for the sake of the old days, in the senior extravaganza, he turned off my Lulu Tulu girl. You know those orders on your desk for our new brand, Lulu Tulu? The song was introduced two weeks ago at the Metropolitan Roof by Violetta, a young lady who married our old football trainer, Little Sullivan. We'll hear her later. I have tickets. Then we'll go to Laith's. There's a turn there by Jim Bailey and his six Lulu Tulu girls. Rather vulgar. While they dance, they chew gum and perform calisthenics with it. But it seems to go. Then, Tom, after we've dined, I'll show you our regular magazine and newspaper advertising in the reading room. Double space. You see, I couldn't ask you to increase, so I stopped it for a time and saved it up but I hope you'll stand for it regularly. It's mainly pictures of Miss Lulu Tulu in a large fedora hat, with a verse below apostrophizing the poetry of motion of her jaws. Then there's a line of limericks about the adventures of the Lulu Tulu gummies, small gum-headed tykes, always in trouble until they find Lulu. 
I got Phillips to do that as a personal favor. Also, know you something, I suppose, remarked Houghton. Yes, but he graduated before my time. I knew his work from the college annual. He's in the magazines now. Then I got Professor Wheaton. Jimmy the Grind, we used to call him. His folks wanted him to be a poet. Imagine Jimmy a poet. I got Professor Wheaton to give us some readers on Tulu as a salivary stimulant. The healthful effect of pure saliva on food production. And the degenerative effect of artificially relieving an organ of its proper functions. That hit the pepsin people, you see. And so it ran until he had covered his plan fully and Dorothy's face with happy smiles. Tom, said the father, if I had opened that letter instead of Dolly. Dorothy suddenly became demure under their gaze and sought to change the subject. Then you admit, Daddy, that a college man is of some use. I'll admit that Tom got the business, but that was because he is naturally clever and business-like, not because... Just a moment, said Brainerd. I think I can show that you're mistaken. I found out that Pepper was doing the wrong thing. By the first rule of criticism, freshman English. What is the author trying to do? Does he do it? Is it worth doing? Substitute advertising man for author, and you have a business that is worth doing, since you continue it. And by the other two questions, I saw his incongruity of subject matter and expression. My economics taught me the law of supply and demand. Analytical research of original authorities taught me where the demand was. There was only the problem of a cause to stimulate it. Through deductive logic and psychology, I got the cause that would appeal, and the effect worked out in an increased demand, which we were ready to supply, just like a problem in math. The elder man smiled. I don't understand a word you said, but it seems to have worked well. In the future, bring in as many of your naughty friends as we need. I'll answer for Kaufman. The other shook his head. I'm not sure they would be any too anxious. Houghton gasped in surprise. What's that? They would not be anxious to go into business? Why not? Why not? There was equal amazement in the young man's tone. Would you be anxious to leave a place where you are surrounded by friends you've tried? Friends that won't stab you in the back the next minute and call it a business deal? Where you're respected and in control of things and plunge out to become a freshman in the world life? To do the sorting and trying all over again? I remember, I remember. And besides, what right has anyone to assume that business is above art, charity, or even mere learning? Billy Tompkins in the slums helping Dagos is a failure to his father. So is Aspwell with his opera. So is Williams with his spectacles in his lab. But who knows? When the great business is finally balanced, he stopped, conscious that he was growing too rhetorical. If you love college ideals so much more than business, observed Houghton, then why did you come to us? A different light stole into the young man's eye. Because, he answered, because I love something else better than either. And he reached his hand under the cloth to one who understood. That is all, except that the next offer from Consolidated Pepsin was, Will you please name your own terms? The End of Love and Advertising by Richard Walton Tullock